In 1995, I fell into web design, and I started doing little websites for, um, I can't remember the name, it's Allen and Bacon. It was an um, a, a imprint of Simon & Schuster, and they were doing websites to go along with their college textbooks. And they said, we need some websites to go along with it. We don't know what this is, we have new media, we have no idea, and we made it up as we went along. And then I ended up working for AOL, who pulled me down here to work for the big corporate monster, pulled me down to DC, rather. And it just started to hurt to work for a place that didn't value a mission. And you could, you could build, you could get a spot on the homepage for a million dollars, but it didn't mean anything. So you'd do stories and they'd pick up packages to say, we want to you know, sell a product. And there was no heart in it. And I, I left after two years to go work for a very small company who developed sites for nonprofits because I wanted my work to mean something. Are there, is there any way that for-profits can be more meaningful, aside from just uh, you know, the traditional cause partnerships? I think they have to, to think about brand differently. I mean, this, I talked about this yesterday in my session, that, that corporations use their brand to move product, where nonprofits are using their brands to move people. And there's a difference when you're designing for nonprofits versus designing for a, a more corporate engagement, because you have to get someone to do something. Coca-Cola is not going to not sell soda if you don't go to their website because everyone knows who Coca-Cola is. But if Charity Water needs to make you give money to help build a well in Uganda, you have to come to the website and know that you can trust their mission, know that they're doing good. So how do you sort of raise to that level of a Coca-Cola brand as a cause-based organization? And it's hard. Um, we've done some research on slideshows, like, you know, one, two, three, People don't pay attention past the second slide. And your calls to action or your most important branding element or your next big important conference is hidden on slide four and no one sees it. And they wonder why they don't get an engagement. So what's the better layout in your opinion? Uh, contextualizing. So if you contextualize what your, your stories are so people know what's coming up and they want to stay and engage with it. Um, Conservation International used to do a very good job of this, that they had little thumbnails of each of their next slides. So you can sort of see a really interesting visual that was engaging and said, like, I want to learn more about that. Let me dig into that. Um, I'm trying to think who does one recently. Uh, Feeding America does one that has sort of slide bars that have contextualized text. So you sort of know what's coming up next. But no one's just going to sit there and wait for one, two, three. And they label them one, two, three to go through. What, what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding when it comes to these campaigns online? that you see consistently amongst these organizations? Um, I wish they'd stop using stock art. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I, I'm, I'm tired of seeing the same image pop up on every website. And a couple years ago, the big image was, was hands. Everyone's coming together and holding their hands and singing Kumbaya kind of thing. And it's the story of the photographer. It's not the story of the organization anymore. So I really wish people would, would curate their visuals and curate their style better to suit them and their mission and their goals and their audience rather than just say, well, this is a really compelling image, let's just put it up and see what happens. See, and I think the problem for a lot of nonprofits is that they think, well, we can't afford or right. they, they don't budget or they don't have time to get a professional photographer. So they go to the stock art because it's professional. Right. They don't want to, would something taken on an iPhone suffice or does that just right. look cheesy? I think when people are trying to get different kinds of, of images that, get, that they don't have a budget to get a photographer, a um, couple ways to do it. One is good cropping is, is really interesting because you can take a picture of five people that are all sitting around the table and you do a shot from all the front and dead on and it's boring. But you figure out the relationship and you see sort of an interesting hand or an interesting face or different angle. It tells more about the engagement between those people than if you just did a straight shot. It's sometimes it's hard to do that. We, we have the benefit on the web of having low resolution so that you could take an iPhone photo and you could zoom in to just one section and it's still pretty clear. Um, another thing that I suggest to folks that don't have lots of budgets are Creative Commons. Um, there are Creative Commons licenses on lots of art that people put out there in the public domain that allow you to reuse it, allow you to modify it. There's a photo search 
So on Flickr, on Google, you can find people who have allowed you to use their photos as long as you give them credit. And you find very genuine art. You find some bad art too, but you find some very genuine stories that might be useful. One of the most important things I think for designers in this space is you have to get smart. You have to comprehend your client. You have to know what they do. You have to know where their pain points are. And I, I like to push people a little bit in my workshops to, to say, I ask them to do a word exercise. And, and I ask them to describe the current user experience or the current state of the organization from an internal stakeholder's perspective, positive or negative. And sometimes there's a boss in the room with someone else, and they sort of look at each other saying, how, how honest can I be? And they loosen up, and finally they just let loose. And some of them, it's like, you know, archaic, stodgy. They say it out oh, loud. Oh, yeah, they'll say it out loud. <laughs> and once they're done firing those people. Hope, and we, you know, we, uh, we make it clear, it's like, no retribution from any of this. Then we ask them to, to, to think about it from the point of view as the user. You know, we remind them of the audiences that we've already done workshops on. Here are your key audiences. Think about what they're going to want from a user experience perspective. Some of those words that you just threw out might come over. Maybe not archaic, but you know, maybe maybe smart, you know, um, strong, respond, you know, authentic. Those might still be words that are used to to the stakeholders would describe it. We ask them to go and make another set of words that are with the audience. And then at the end of that whole exercise, they have to narrow it down to 10 words. And I use different colors. It's a sticky note exercise. So you can sort of literally put the words up on a board and people can sort of see what, what, what's forming, what kind of voice is coming out of it. And I color code it so you can see which words have come all the way through the exercise. And so where is that thread of genuinity? Is that even a word? Thread of genuineness? I don't know. What is the core of the organization? And, and what is that voice that you need to represent? But if you don't do anything like that, you're just, you're just saying, okay, it's a nonprofit, they need something that's engaging, we'll do a big picture and call it a day with a big button to say give. So you have to dig into it, and you have to be able to communicate it.